Um, uh, thank you, Florence, and of course, thank you for inviting me to lunch. Uh, let me just get off uh, what I want to say right away. I, and then please don't choke on your food, I do not represent the government. Uh, I'm merely an advisor to uh, Kerry Lam. Uh, sometimes I wonder whether I represent the thinking of the government. But uh, I'm here to speak uh, in my personal capacity as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, I want to share with you uh, the, the, way, the way that I look at the very sensitive and uh, high temperature to uh, topic of extradition. Now I want to start with the quote from a report in the UK which was uh, published in 2011. Uh, in 2010 uh, there was a lot of debate, uh, much like the debate we had in Hong Kong at the moment, uh, about extradition, uh, because I think there was a, a huge debate in the United Kingdom at that time that in relation to extradition, do we need, when I say we, I mean the British, uh, proof of prima facie case of a criminal charge? Uh, because uh, within the EU, uh, the, there is this regime which call for simply handing over of a prisoner without even the proof of prima facie case. And that prompted the UK government to commission a, uh, a committee uh, comprised of uh, very uh, 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 eminent judges and, and practitioners um, who look to look into the question of extradition. And, and I extracted a, a quote from there, which says that extradition is based on the principle that it is in the interest of all civilized communities that offenders should not be allowed to escape justice by simply crossing national borders, and that states should facilitate the punishment of criminal conduct. It is a form of international cooperation in criminal matters based on comity uh, intended to promote uh, justice. Now, having got that off my chest, uh, I want to go back a little bit uh, uh, point in time. In fact, in 1990, the United Nations passed a resolution which urged upon all member states to work towards a simple and efficient extradition regime. And that resolution was followed by what is called a model treaty on extradition. And in that model uh, treaty, it sets out you know, all the things that uh, the UN urges all member states to do or not to do. Now, uh, again, I, I've uh, extracted the quote here. Uh, it says, and I think this is the most important point that a lot of people uh, uh, would concentrate on, uh, respect human dignity and recalling the rights conferred upon every person involved in criminal proceedings as embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the ICCPR. ICCPR, I think it's very familiar that to you, it is of course the world standard on human and civil uh, and political rights. But the UN at the same breath says that uh, member states must continue to acknowledge that the protection of human rights should not be considered inconsistent with effective international cooperation in criminal matters, while recognizing the need for fully effective mechanisms for extraditing fugitives. So the UN was advocating a very simple, effective procedure. Uh, in fact, uh, the quicker you can resolve it in the requested state, the better. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it laid down certain standards and how, as to how uh, political rights and civil rights are, are being respected. Now, uh, as a result, as I say, that there was a, a model treaty being adopted by the uh, United Nations, which applies to every member state. Now, in April 1997, Hong Kong then enacted the current version of the uh, offenders, uh, fugitive offenders ordinance. Why do I emphasize the date? Because it's April 1997. It's prior to July 1997. So the current law is enacted by the colonial government, not by the SAR government. And as you could imagine, because it was enacted, well, maybe I shouldn't say because, but the fact that it was uh, enacted by the UK government means that it follows very closely to the model treaty that I have explained to you that was adopted by the United Nations. Now, 
I should therefore very quickly uh, um, uh, remind you of the various safeguards that is already inbuilt into the present law. Never mind about the amendment, just look at the existing law as it is. First of all, it can only extradition can only apply to serious crimes, right? And these crimes are defined. They are defined in a schedule which do not include political crimes or any crimes to do with opinion. Or I would like to think human rights. So by definition, if we were to enact Article 23 tomorrow, and I hope it, it will happen tomorrow or at least for a few years' time, even if we were to enact Article 23 uh, uh, legislation, those offences will not be able, by definition, will not be able to find themselves into this law because this law is not applicable to political offences. The second qualification is that it, the conduct must be serious criminal conduct in Hong Kong were it to occur here. So when I read the bookseller uh, 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 saying that he, he wanted to go to Taiwan, I, I think to myself he must be very poorly advised because they haven't done anything as far as I know which could constitute a serious crime in Hong Kong. Not to mention that uh, what he uh, was accused of doing has a very, very high level of political nature. Uh, so I, I don't quite understand why he thinks that he would be persecuted within Hong Kong, but he is, of course, entirely free to choose the place of his residence, and he, he now left us and go to Taiwan, and, and uh, good luck to him. Now, the third point is that no matter how you describe the charge, it must not contain any element of political nature. The fourth element is that even if, even if, uh, that uh, the charge itself doesn't indicate it has a political nature, uh, the request must not be made for the purpose of prosecuting on account of race, religion, nationality or political opinions. Fifth, even if the charge were free of political elements, and you can't say that the prosecution was in relation to race, religion, nationality or political opinion, if the person involved, if the person involved might be prejudiced in his fair trial or in his punishment and may be restricted in his defense uh, by reason of his race, religion, nationality, political opinions, again, the law would not apply. What the law says is that the ordinance doesn't apply. If the ordinance doesn't apply, that there is no power, no legal power, for anybody, let alone Carrie Lam, the administration or the courts, to extradite him. And, and of course, the law says very clearly that uh, uh, the uh, writ of habeas corpus is always available to anybody uh, being requested uh, to be transferred to a foreign jurisdiction. And of course, uh, if you apply for a writ of habeas corpus, uh, Hapers Coppers, it would be a separate full trial by the court as to whether or not uh, the elements mentioned in the ordinance have been contravened. Um, the sixth safeguard is that the offender must not be extradited to a third place. What does it mean? It means that if you were extradited to Macau, Macau then cannot extradite him to China, or to, to the mainland, and, and, and so on. Um, how do you police this? Well, we police this by uh, extracting the, a, a relevant and opposite uh, guarantee or assurance from the requesting uh, party. Uh, seventh, the offender must not be visited with that penalty. And again, in the case of Taiwan, if they were to make a formal request tomorrow, assuming the amendment passed, the first thing the Hong Kong government would ask is an assurance that the death penalty is not applicable to this poor young man. Uh, because as I understand it in Taiwan, there is no, uh, there is no differentiation between murder and manslaughter. And, and so, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, this young uh, uh, Hong Kong person, if he were transferred to Taiwan, may face the death penalty. But if there is no guarantee, again, the law doesn't apply. 
the offender must not be subject to torture, another inhumane treatment, or his dignity be harmed. And again, this goes to uh, the question of guarantee and assurance from the requested party. In this respect, the court is mandated to receive evidence and must first decide if these safeguards are met. And I want to cite an example which is called the Lord Advocate Against Dean. It is a case involving a Scot killing somebody in Taiwan while drunk driving. And he claimed that if he were extradited to Taiwan, he would be treated unfairly by fellow inmates because he is a foreigner, he has killed a Taiwan person. And so Taiwan has to issue a lot of guarantees and there was a long trial in the UK which eventually ended in the decision in 2017 where the Supreme Court says that he could be extradited. In fact, that decision is of highly persuasive authority in Hong Kong. Uh, what should be the basis of the extradition? Well, uh, if a defendant uh, claim that he would be he would not refer, refer, receive fair treatment, then the court has got to look into it. And as I, I've said out here, uh, in fact, what has happened in the Taiwan case, but I see the time is uh, catching up, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, again, I want to uh, uh, sum up with a quote, another quote from the UK report. It says here, states have increasingly recognized that effective extradition should operate on the basis of mutual trust and confidence and not on suspicion and accusations. In fact, if you look at the UK experience, uh, at the last count, UK has entered into bilateral agreement and has extradition arrangements with 108 countries. I said here 94. That, in fact, uh, is wrong. It's not up to date. 108. The US has got 110, and the list is more or less the same, and it includes places like, and, and again, I, I, I mean no offense, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Cuba, Iraq, Kenya, Libya, Mexico, Nigeria, Uganda, Zambia, and so on. Some of this, you might think, has a worse human record than China. So why is it the UK government and the US government think it's all right? to have extradition arrangement with these countries. Do they not care about UK citizens? US citizens? <laughs> well, that shows that a lot of people nowadays are looking at this topic from the wrong end of the telescope. They're asking, what is the human rights record of the requesting party? But that's the wrong end of the telescope. The UN says that it is the requester party, i.e. Hong Kong, which is important. You apply the same human rights standard, the same fair trial standards to everybody, to every country, be it United States, UK, Libya, Iraq, Kenya, no matter who. If you come to Hong Kong, we apply the same standard which is set up in the law. And unless we are satisfied that a fair trial can be had, and this person will be fairly treated, the law doesn't apply. So why do we bicker among ourselves, quarrel, go out on a march and say you're worried? If you say you're worried, effectively you're saying you don't trust our own judiciary. Well, I'm sorry. I'm very proud of our judiciary. I'm very proud of the legal profession in Hong Kong. I once spoke to what, uh, an Australian consulate, I don't know whether he's here or not, and I asked him, do you believe in our judiciary? He said, of course we do. We, uh, our Chief Justice was sitting on, on your court. Yes, we have eminent judges from Canada, from Australia, from the UK, sitting in our Court of Final Appeal. So if you don't believe in our judiciary, are you saying you don't believe in your own judges? So, I'm saying that uh, uh, I'm here to answer all questions, but I'm telling you that uh, we should be looking at the right end of the telescope. We should be asking, are these safeguards sufficient? And, and enter into a meaningful debate about how, if we need be, to improve the safeguards that we have. Let's talk on that basis. Thank you.
the call. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's good. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to be here always at the FCC. Now, you know, uh, if the Hong Kong government really takes the United Nations standards so seriously, it would really save us a lot of trouble in a lot of issues. But unfortunately, they don't. Now, first of all, I want to talk about the way in which the government has handled this legislative proposal. And then I'll go into analyzing the legislative proposal. Why do I want to talk about the manner in which it handled it? Because it is important for the Hong Kong people and the international community to look at what this government is trying to do and the way they're trying to do it. Now, I would like to quote from a speech made by a former chairman of the bar given in 2001. Um, our dear Ronnie Tong gave this very speech at the opening of the legal year in which he said, the people of Hong Kong have a legitimate aspiration, even expectation, that the ideals of the grand concept of one country, two systems will be realized and that their constitutional freedom and right will be guaranteed and protected. That rule of law will continue to prevail. Very nice words, Ronnie. It is the constitutional duty of the Hong Kong SAR government to fulfill such aspiration and expectation. Again, fine words, Ronnie. Where a constitutional issue which directly concerns the fundamental right or freedom of the people has risen, and I quote, nothing will divide or even polarize a society more than if the government is to adopt a defensive mentality in any rational debate. No man is infallible, and no government is beyond reproach." End quote. Fine words, Ronnie. Defensive mentality. Let's talk about defensive mentality. When 130,000 people took to the streets, including my mother, on Sunday, what did the government come out to say? Well, Ronnie said, well, it doesn't matter how many people took to the streets. It doesn't matter how many people are to protest. This government must soldier on, must carry on with these legislative amendments. The chief secretary said, oh, you know, people just don't understand. They're uninformed. You know, they don't know what they're doing. Um, it, you know, in 2003, when half a million people took to the streets, similar comments were made by the pro-establishment. It seems that people never learn. This defensive mentality is what this government has. And it's not good governance. And I'm, sh I'm sure Ronnie would agree with me because he went on to say this in his speech. Rather, the role of a responsible government as a leader of the community it serves is to analyze and explain to the people the important constitutional or rule of law principles and values involved in order to stimulate the calm and rational debate in the resolution of the constitutional or rule of law issue concern. Exactly. I can't put it better myself. Well, what did the government do in this legislative amendment? First of all, in February, they put a one paragraph in the 15-page Let's Go brief, one paragraph, to say that they're going to do this. No explanation, no introduction, just one little paragraph buried in a document, hoping that no one would notice. Of course, we noticed, and we raised it. We raised hell. How come this issue suddenly came about this way? And then the Secretary for Security did a one-month consultation, or was it three weeks, I can't remember, that was so low-key, there was no proper document, no proper consultation document explaining what they're trying to achieve, the different proposals that one would expect they to come up with, explaining the pros and cons of each proposal and what they're trying to achieve. No, nothing. This, this so-called consultation lasted three to four weeks with no proper documentation explaining what this consultation is about, and there's no report up to, to date. There's no report of what views was re, uh, that the government received in this consultation. Now, what happened to that responsible government that Ronnie was talking about in 2001? That they have a responsibility to explain to the people, especially over this issue, when it concerns the rights and freedoms of the Hong Kong people. What happened to that responsible government? Huh? If they are really responsible, they should do a proper consultation. As the British government, the US government, the Canadian government have pointed out, and other international members of the international community. If you're going to do this thing, 
you have to explain because there are many complex issues involved. The people of Hong Kong deserves a proper explanation. None of that. So that's the attitude adopted by the Hong Kong government so far. And you can't blame the people. The, those who took to the streets uh, on the 28th of April, you know, I don't think they don't understand it. They understand it. You know, they understand what is the government trying to do. They understand the implications to that. Of course, maybe they don't understand the legal niceties of uh, the differences between the UK extradition regime and the Hong Kong one. But the Hong Kong people don't need to understand the ni legal niceties because they understand the freedoms and their rights are being threatened. And they are entitled and should take to the streets. Now let's talk about this amendment. Now it all started with this Taiwanese murder case in which the government say that they want to um, uh, resolve. Now we fully support that. We fully support that there should be a resolution of this uh, uh, heinous crime that took place in Taiwan. But there are ways to do it as the Hong Kong Bar Association has repeatedly pointed out. If you want to resolve the Taiwanese murder case, you can do it by way of an ad hoc arrangement with Taiwan that only deals with uh, this case and then we can then consider on a different occasion how to amend our extradition uh, regime in a wholesale or more fully uh, considered way. But in, if you want to deal with the Taiwanese murder case and when you have such a short time frame there are ways in which you can make minor amendments to the existing regime, do an ad hoc arrangement with Taiwan, but no, they didn't. They consider they don't want to do this. They want to do a wholesale change to the uh, uh, legislative proposal, but why? The Hong Kong Bar Association also pointed out you could confer jurisdiction on the Hong Kong courts so that the Hong Kong courts can deal with this Taiwanese case. Why don't you adopt that approach? Simple. It would receive the support of my colleagues in the Legislative Council and the understanding and appreciation of the Hong Kong community. There are ways to deal with this Taiwanese case. But no, you know, they, they choose not to do it uh, in these ways and they have to carry on with this major wholesale uh, reform of our legislative proposal that has been tabled in LegCo. You know, this, um, this exception that we have in our laws, that we do not extradite people to other parts of mainland China, was not a mistake. It was not a loophole. It was deliberately put there in order to safeguard the rights and freedoms of the Hong Kong people. Ronnie talks about human rights. We're talking about people being sent to a legal system where frankly we do not and people understand why that we don't have trust in that legal system in mainland China and if you look at what happened to people there uh, who are standing trial there people get detained indefinitely without trial forced confessions torture in some cases uh, trial is one day not open to the press or even family members no independent legal representation and certainly no independent judiciary. Now we don't want to talk about human rights, due process and fair trial. We ought to be talking about those issues rather than beating around the bush to say that, oh, uh, is it the case that you don't trust, trust our judiciary? Of course we trust our judiciary and there's no question that the Hong Kong judiciary will do its job and can be fully trusted. But there's only so much a judge can do when presented with evidence that the question that he has to ask is whether there is a prima facie case on the surface of the documents that has been presented. Now, our ordinance also doesn't have additional safeguards that in the UK, for example, the Extradition Act 2003, there is a specific provision that allows the judge to refuse extradition if he believes that the extradition would violate the European Convention of Human Rights, Section 21 of the Extradition Act. We don't have such safeguards in Hong Kong. Why doesn't the government put in additional safeguards, like Ronnie has said? And come to think about it, the actual proposal now actually remove legislative scrutiny. It allows the chief executive to decide on her own what to do on the extradition matter. Remove let's go scrutiny that we have right now. It removes the court's function in authenticating supporting documents. 
So the courts have lesser of a power to scrutinize the process. And there's no increase of the power of the courts, as I said. Like in the UK, they can refuse an extradition if they believe it violates the person's fair trial and due process. None of that. You can't give the burden on responsibility on the judiciary when it is really the duty of the government, the executive branch of government, to ensure that we do not enter into extradition agreement with places where there are no rule of law. Now, you mentioned there are, yes, countries that has entered into extradition agreement with China, Spain, Portugal, France. But note this one thing. These countries expressly stated in their extradition agreement with China that they do not extradite their own citizens to face trial in China. Why? Because they know very well they do not trust the rule of law or the legal system in China. And that is a matter of fact, a consensus held amongst many members of the international community. Now, very briefly, I want to talk about the Taiwanese situation. Now, the Taiwanese Mainland Affairs Department came out to say, uh, the, the Mainland Affairs Authority, look why we came out to say that they note what the chief executive has said, that there are many concerns regarding the human rights implications of these current legislative amendments. They say that they are not prepared to sign an extradition agreement on the assumption that it would be a accepting of the One China policy and also that unless these human rights considerations and concerns are resolved, they are extremely hesitant in signing anything with the Hong Kong SAR government. So at the end of the day, we can't even resolve the Taiwanese murder case. Even if these legislative amendments are passed and the human rights issues are not concerned, the Taiwanese authorities are not going to sign an extradition agreement with Hong Kong. So how do you resolve that Taiwanese murder case? It doesn't. It doesn't achieve even what they say they want to achieve at the very beginning. So let's come back to trying to be sensible or trying to be Really, if you want to resolve this issue, let's separate the Taiwanese murder case. Let's focus on that. We can get behind all the uh, uh, different parties in LegCo to support a one-off ad hoc arrangement to deal with this Taiwanese case, an arrangement which the Taiwanese authorities will accept and actually sign. Something can actually be achieved at the end of the day, rather than go about this wholly um, out of the blue, ill thought out, sudden legislative amendment with no proper consultation, it will only drive to divide the society even more. Now, Carrie Lam has said at the beginning of her term, saying that she wants to heal society, she wants to bring people together, she wants to heal divisions. Then stop this thing, Carrie. You are dividing society, you are damaging Hong Kong in unprecedented ways and also to one country, two systems. I hope Ronnie will bring this message back to her next time when they have a meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to both. Let's move to uh, the discussion. And uh, if I may ask uh, to the two of you to reply very briefly, so it will help the conversation uh, cover more ground. I'll start by stepping back a little bit from the detailed uh, argument um, and put the same question to the two of you for what you know or what you guess, who is actually behind these proposed changes? Is it uh, the chief executive, Carrie Lam herself, as she claims, or is it actually Beijing? Uh, Mr. Tong, can I ask you on this? Well. Uh, first of all, sorry, I, you know, although I'm an ex member, I, I can't uh, divulge confidential information, but I believe uh, the request came from Kerry, and the government has spent a lot of time trying to convince Beijing to agree. But can I just take this opportunity just to point out that, uh, you know, I expect Dennis to say what he said, but there are a number of uh, things which are not factual. Uh, Carrie Lam, under the ordinance or under the amendment, has no power to exercise other than 
to initiate the process and to veto if the court were to agree to extradite, to veto, not to order extradition. No, the law says specifically that there should be a separate full trial where the court would receive evidence relating to whether or not the prisoner can receive a fair trial. So contrary to what he tells you, what he tells you is not correct. Uh, in relation to the committal of the criminal offence itself, yes, we treat it as if the committal is that of Hong Kong. But there would be a separate trial with full evidence, as in the case of Lord Advocate against Dean, if it relates to the human rights of that person. Thirdly, uh, there is a provision which uh, deals with the human rights nature or the, the, the need for a fair trial. I just quoted chapter and verse in the section. In fact, section 5, which is a section where all the safeguards are, makes it very plain that it is different from the criminal aspect of the extradition request. It deals with certain criteria which, if not met, the law would not be applicable in the sense that you cannot extradite anybody. So again, I'm sorry, that's factually wrong. Now, I think there are many other uh, uh, minor uh, uh, inaccuracies which I, I can't, uh, within the time available to me, to uh, enumerate each and every one of you. But I do urge you, don't believe Ronnie Tom. <laughs> don't believe me. Go and read the ordinance. Go and read the UN uh, 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 treaty. The, look, read the, the Moto Treaty. Oh, by the way, there's one other thing I must mention. Uh, ben is mentioned about uh, uh, not uh, uh, needing authorization from the relevant uh, requesting uh, country. That, in fact, is Article 7 of the Model Treaty. That, in fact, is what the UN said. That you do not waste time on criminal aspect by asking for authorization. Uh, that matter can be dealt with when you look at the criminal nature or the criminal aspect of the request. What is most important, which is the, up, the uppermost mind of the UN, is to say you've got the human rights aspect, which is an entirely different part of the exercise. And it's an entirely different part of the regime. So you've got to understand that. Thank you. Um, can you briefly uh, reply to my yeah, initial um, question, please? I, uh, to your initial question, answers I don't know whether okay. it's from Kerry or Beijing. I don't know. Or, you know, I'm not. I'm not in, in the government. And. Um, also, to talk about factual accuracies, I think a lot of the countries that Ronnie actually mentioned in her PowerPoint are countries where they have criminal assistance agreements with UK and the US, but no, no, not I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, sorry. I'm Dennis, sorry. But please be factual. First of all, what I mentioned in my uh, PowerPoint is what is in the law in Hong Kong. Secondly, in UK, they have a provision uh, to deal no, with ad cases. That, Ronnie. Can you right? not cut into and my the, time? The case of I'm law talking about the against countries. Team is a very example of the exercise of jurisdiction under the ad hoc provision, which is what the Hong Kong government now is trying to emulate. I'm talking about countries where they have they may have extradition agreements there are of course countries who do have extradition agrees agreements with China but I've just pointed out in my speech that countries who we we call civilized democratic countries like France Spain and Portugal have an express condition where they say they do not extradite their own citizens to face trial in China and that's a fact and it is you can go check it uh, and a lot of the countries that you mentioned have mutual criminal assistance uh, arrangements with China but not extradition. Uh, again, okay. that is an inaccuracy. Uh, I think we want to... No, can I just point out this? I'm sorry, I cannot stand people giving out untruths, okay? I cannot stand it. Now, then in fact, it is, within, in the it, it is in fact within the model treaty that every country must reserve to itself a right to veto extradition on the basis that this national is being involved. In fact, if you look at every single bilateral treaty, every single law on extradition, you will find that there is a provision there saying that if it involves your own national, then you don't need to give any reason to refuse extradition. We have the same provision in Hong Kong. Now, the only problem with that 
is that it was enacted, as I reminded you, before the handover. So that provision at the moment reads that the chief executive is entitled to veto the extradition on the ground that the person requested is of Chinese nationality. Right? Now, but if the request come, comes from mainland, how does it work? Well, I've already mentioned and, and, and on another occasion that we can look into that. And if you're saying, well, let's put in Hong Kong permanent resident so that the CE has got a full veto power without giving any reason whatsoever to refuse, to refuse extradition, not order extradition. Well, let's have that debate, right? The fact that you have a provision that uh, you do not extradite your own national. I'm sorry, it's not designed for the purpose of China. It is there from day one for everybody. Okay, if we could uh, move to another aspect of uh, this uh, debate, which is um, the, s the position that the, the business uh, community has, uh, has taken. It's quite rare that the government uh, is opposed by the business sector. How um, important and how does it complicate things for the government? Dennis? I think... Um when you look at statements that has been made by not only uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce but other international chambers of commerce in Hong Kong who rarely speak out on these uh, matters and also local business community um, you know the local business community my colleagues who represent the business sectors in Lechigo tell me that they are having trouble understanding why these proposals are being put forward. They didn't know about it and they were very concerned about it. They went into talks with the government right away and then the government caved in by saying, okay, fine, 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 you're the business community, let's uh, uh, accept a whole series of white collar crimes. And I think that is even worse. The government is saying, okay, for these people, they're business people, they're, you know, rich and uh, powerful people, let's give them an exemption. They're concerned about white collar crimes. What well, about the ordinary Hong Kong people? Ronnie say he doesn't understand the booksellers. Well, I'll tell you what you don't understand, Ronnie. If you have been abducted by authorities, taken across the border, incarcerated, away from your friends and your families, have charges laid against you, I think you'll be afraid too. I think it is not hard to understand the booksellers and their concerns. I think it actually is disingenuous to say that you don't understand people who has been incarcerated and face unfair situations like that. That sense of injustice is exactly how universal human rights are. I, I don't disagree with Dennis on that. I mean, I, I, I agree with him that uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, room for improvement in how to initiate this uh, proposal to amend uh, in explaining to the public what does it involve. Uh, I, I have been in constant touch with John Lee, Secretary for Security, and every time I talked to him, I said, oh, why don't you go and explain more? And, and he said, well, Ronnie, I, I explained that every opportunity that I had, I speak to all the press, but... Would he come to the FCC? Sorry? Can you invite him to the FCC? Well, if you invite him, I don't know. Well, then yeah, he's invited, this is official. But, but what he's saying is that, look, Ronnie, you know, after I've spoken to the press, I don't even get a mention in the paper. But the fact that you said something, it was a headline. So I say, are you simply relying on me? I mean, that's not fair. As I said, I don't represent the government. I'm, I'm merely here as a lawyer to explain my point of view. And I emphasize, it's my point of view, right? You may think that it's very biased, it's very unfair, but it's my point of view, and I'm to be supported by facts, supported by legal principles, uh, and supported by the UN. I'm sorry, right? But uh, I think the government need to do more. Yes, I think there is room for improvement for the amendment. As I say, let's bring back the discussion to a rational basis. If you say, look, there are areas which we can bolster up our, our protection of the human rights, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's discuss that. All right? But 
I hope you understand, me being an EXCO member, I'm not here to wave banners and say, look, you must amend this, that and the other. I mean, that would be wholly inconsistent with my position as an EXCO member. But I have already given out very, very strong hints on one of the televisions in, in Hong Kong on Sunday. I've already spoken. I said, look, these are the areas that you can look into to see how you can improve the amendment. So let's work on that. Let's just have a rational debate. Instead of taking a personal attack on me, it wouldn't get to the government because I don't represent the government. Right? Sure. And so, uh, I'm sorry, one final thing. There is still time to go. The Taiwan case is one case. But there are many, many other cases out there. The only way, I'm, I firmly believe that the only way in which Hong Kong can persevere and continue the one country, two systems beyond 2047 is to make us a world city, a true world city, not the backwaters in criminal matters of Asia. So if we can bolster up our system, we can work on many, many other Taiwan cases. But if you give up at this point of time, and this is perhaps the most opportune point of time, then you never get done. I have been waiting for this for 20 years when I was chairman. One of the first things I did was to tell the Hong Kong government, I said, you know, this is ridiculous. You have bilateral extradition agreements with other countries, but not with your own country, where we have the most intimate relationship, where people are crossing border every day, every minute, every second. And do you know how many serious criminals are there in Hong Kong from China? I'm told it's in the, in the number of, 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 of tens, a number of tens, 30 something. And these are real criminals, not booksellers. Thank you very much. Um, my last question before I open to the floor is about the risks uh, for journalists. Um, how do you assess them? Say I interview someone that uh, Chinese uh, authorities do not approve of, or I invite someone at the FCC that Chinese authorities do not approve of. Um, it's not a crime under Hong Kong law. It is a crime somehow under Chinese law. Um, are we at risk or not? As I said, <laughs> you cannot be prejudiced I, I by, by opinion, by your opinion. So, I'm sorry, members of the press has a lot of their own opinion, apart, apart from reporting facts. Mm -hmm. So, they by definition are exempt from the statute, but don't ask for specific exemption. I think that's wrong. I agree with Dennis that it's wholly wrong to accept white collar crimes because they can do so much damage to a civilized community, particularly you know, a financial center like Hong Kong. So I, I disagree with the government's uh, agreement to accept the, the business sector, right? Uh, but you're basically saying that uh, there, is no, there won't be anything like opinion crimes and... and uh, well, it's written specifically in the, in the law and it, if, you, if you say that our judges can't read English, then I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I just don't, don't want to accept it. The law tells them that if it involves opinion, whether in the charge or in the person involved, then the law doesn't apply. Okay, Dennis, can you reply? Very that? quickly, um, just in case any, any of you are out of town from out of town, um, uh, Hong Kong is not a criminal backwaters or uh, full of criminals everywhere. Hong Kong actually has one of the lowest crime rates in the world. It's one of the safest cities in the world. So just, you know, in case you were wondering that we've got criminals looming everywhere. Um, uh, secondly, I want to say that, um, of course, Ronnie is right that if they go after you for a political uh, uh, a related opinion or religious opinion, of course the courts will throw it out within five seconds. I have no, no question about that. So if you worry about you know, them coming after you as a journalist for what you're reporting, then uh, you have nothing to worry about. I tell the same thing to people who run NGOs or civil society that they have nothing to worry about as far as that's concerned. But I don't think I'm the only one who is not naive enough to think that the Chinese government can and has a history of going after people using any other crime. They could weaponize the system the same way they've weaponized their own system against their own citizens. What was Ai Weiwei arrested and convicted for? Not for his artwork or his political opinion, for tax evasion. If journalists go in and out of China, 
every day for their work. They have a lot of context, a lot of activities in mainland China. Would any of that be used against them and weaponized against them because of what they wrote? Of course they don't have to go after you for a politically related offense. They wouldn't be that stupid. They could and can weaponize it. I think that is the fear. But, but, but again, there is this requirement of double criminality. Whatever you are accused of doing, you've got to test it against the fact, the provision, which says that if that were to happen in Hong Kong, does it constitute one of the specified serious crimes? Yeah. If it doesn't fit in, then again, the law doesn't apply. Thank you very much. So we'll open uh, the floor to question now to uh, Wei. Um, Yes? Oh, sorry. I I'd like to Thank give the, the, the mic to uh, the journalist and correspondent first, and we have a, a big group of media at the back as well that welcome to uh, ask questions. And, and please introduce yourself Thank and, you and keep your question short. short. Okay. We do, Channel News Asia. I have a question for uh, Mr. Tong. I understand you say Hong Kong judges could uh, reach, reject a um, extradition request if the judge thinks this person would not be able to receive a fair trial in China for various reasons. But you're also a politician. Do you think politically it's possible for a Hong Kong judge to pass essentially a judgment on China's entire political system without getting another pile of bricks falling on the judiciary here? I, I think that's an insult on our judiciary. I'm sorry. I think it is, right? Um, you, you have looked at the kind of decision that we are capable of giving now. And they uh, receive the highest uh, respect from other courts in the world, not just common law countries. You know, I have yet to see a decision which you can ridicule as being succumbing to political pressure. I'm sorry, it just hasn't happened yet. So I have full confidence, and I hope that you, you will learn to uh, have that confidence. Um, I think the other thing, I'm going to just finish by saying this. The other thing we are privileged to be in is that we have a very transparent and uh, 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 diligent, hard-working press. Yes, if something were to happen, do you think it can escape the attention of the press in Hong Kong or the international press in Hong Kong. Thank you. I think I think immediately if something were to, something like that were to happen, it would be all over the, the newspaper and television and radios of Hong Kong. And and do you think that you know the Hong Kong government and the, and the Chinese government would be that stupid to rock the boat here? You know, I hope not. Dennis? Yeah, I really hope not too, but you know, booksellers did happen, so... Booksellers are not extra case, I'm sorry. Dennis, let's just not... Look, that's the reason why, Ronnie, that we do not that have is faith exactly in the Chinese the reason authorities. Why you need because they come in here, disregard our laws, and abduct people. And how what? do you expect people to trust their criminal legal system? Well, that is system? exactly... That's I mean, number one. Number I, two, I just this, to uh, answer your point, lady, <laughs> is that... Um, we are calling for provisions to be put into the legislative proposal that would empower the court expressly to look at whether that person once sent over to mainland China would receive a fair trial and due process and uh, have his uh, human rights respected. A similar provision as that in the UK Extradition Act Section 21. I think that can be done and if Ronnie is serious about building more safeguards into it. I'm willing to work with him to put in more safeguards into our law so that human rights and due process will be respected. Well, let's and we'll do, do that together, Ronnie. Well, let's do that. But I, I, must, I must respond to the bookseller's case. I mean, number one, it's not an extradition case, but I, I know it may sound callous and cheap, but if we have a legitimate regime whereby people can be extradited and they are subject to the control and safeguard of the courts, it's better for them to try to do something illegal, isn't it? I mean, isn't that what we're working towards? I mean, if, if I may, are you implying that had, had this extradition... I'm, I'm not implying anything. No. I'm just saying You're that saying let's it, could have, have, it would have worked better. Let's have a better system and give them less excuse to do something stupid and something illegal. 
Thank you. It, it's like saying, it, 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 uh, instead of me robbing you, why don't you just let me rob you legally? <laughs> um, Cliff, please raise your hand if you have questions. We, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, Ronnie, you, you said that there is room for improvement. Uh, with the uh, proposed amendments and you said that we need to have a rational debate. Uh, is not the best way of having a, a rational debate on these complex issues which are causing a great deal of concern to pull these amendments from LegCo and to have a fully fledged public consultation on them? Well, as I said, I mean, I, yeah, I want to take up on what Dennis said just now and if you think that uh, let's try to work something into the amendment whereby it is expressly saying that uh, uh, the protection of human rights is a very important aspect. Let's have a debate on that. Now, I personally think that is not strictly speaking necessary because we already have the Human Rights, the Bill of Rights uh, in Hong Kong and are already it is in a superior position than the uh, offenders, the fugitive offenders ordinance and the court is already uh, 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 obligated to look at the Bill of Rights uh, and to test every extradition request. But if you want to write it into the uh, fugitive offenders ordinance expressly to say you know, let's have the full protection of, say, Article 14 of the ICCPR. No, I think that that's 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 certainly workable. I mean, let's just talk about it, this debate about it, and and try to make it happen, right? And, and instead of saying, well, China is so evil that yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with him. As soon as you mention the word China, I'll go away. No, I'm sorry, that's not the right attitude, and I'm not going to engage in debate on that issue. Um, Edith, Robert, and then Paul. You want me to go first? Uh, yes, Paul Zumman. Um, I, I read in an article in the media in 2017 that according to the Hong Kong government, there were more than 4,000 Hong Kong people detained on the mainland between 2010 to 12 and 2016. What they and their family members have probably discovered is that there is only so much the Hong Kong government can do to help them and that the legal and judicial and penitentiary system in the mainland is very different from Hong Kong. Do you have friends or family currently in China in trouble? Are you currently helping I, I friends and family friends currently and in, China? in China? But what is your experience? May I ask, no, may I I ask my I question? I just want to ask the a Chinese question. System is okay. less Sorry, Ronnie. We, 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 listen, we listen to the end of Paul's short this question. It's a very short question. <laughs> So my question is, do you have friends and family I out there? Do you helping friends and family no, currently? No, they're not in trouble. Are you in, to are you in touch not with in trouble. But let Thank me you. just tell you, if this amendment were to be passed, then the Hong Kong government, in fact, would be in a position to ask for more assurances than when you have a bilateral agreement. Because the bilateral agreement spell out the specific requirements, and you can't change that. But if it's an ad hoc application, then every case would depend on its own facts. And you can ask for extra assurance. The case that I mentioned, advocate, Lord Advocate against Dean, is a very good example. In that case, the Taiwanese government has got to give out assurances that the prisoner will be imprisoned in a private cell with private shower facilities and toilet facilities, that he will have seven hours of exercise every day separate from every other inmate in, in that prison. So you can have a better uh, protection on an ad hoc case than with a bilateral agreement case. Mm. That was the case of Taiwan though, which was not the case of China. Very, but then very you short to... answer to your question, Paul. Yes, I do. Um, I'm a member of the uh, China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group and over the years we've helped many human rights lawyers um, who are my colleagues and the, the things that they have to go through just to do what lawyers are supposed to do, the way they are treated, detained, and their families members threatened, yes, I have first-hand experience of what those people went through. And I just cannot imagine having to go through that system for any one of us in this room or any member of the Hong Kong community have to go through the same thing. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Edith Terry, and a question for both of you. Uh, I do have in mind uh, the circumstances of a friend who's a Hong Kong uh, permanent resident 
who's been detained in China and, and accused of uh, a theft of state secrets, Michael Kovrig, a Canadian citizen um, and former diplomat. So Hong Kong has no authority over national security. What happens if theft of state secrets is the basis of an extradition request? Uh, is it, uh, you know, obviously uh, that's not a crime within Hong Kong, but Hong Kong doesn't have jurisdiction or authority over the definition of that type of crime, so far as I understand. Well, as far as extradition is concerned, I've already explained that none of the uh, offences under Article 23 can, as a matter of, by definition, find itself into the extradition agreement, which means that you can't extradite people for any, of, any political crimes of that nature. We don't have jurisdiction. Um, if you get somebody who is being imprisoned in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in China, but he is a Hong Kong citizen. Of course, we can ask for visitation rights. Now, in relation to the ad hoc arrangement, uh, this is one of the things that you can, you can ask for in terms of assurance without which the court can say no to any request. As I said, again, I quote the example of Lord Advocate against Dean, the, the, the case in 2017. Mm -hmm. Now, what is happening at, the present, at present is that if somebody were to commit a crime in Hong Kong and goes to China, and if he were a Chinese, a Hong Kong resident, the Chinese authorities would then uh, uh, export them back. And then with a phone call to the Hong Kong police and they would be waiting for him in Lawwood Bridge and he would be arrested. But if that person is a mainlander, then it doesn't apply, then they don't have to extradite uh, that person back to Hong Kong. The same applies to Hong Kong. If a mainlander comes to Hong Kong and commits a crime, and mainland asks for extradition, and we have no extradition arrangements with them, we can export that person on the basis that he has no right to remain in Hong Kong because he's not a Hong Kong resident, and then he will be sent back. And again, we will notify the, uh, the security people, the, the, the police, they will be waiting for him in Lawwood Bridge. But if that person were a Hong Kong person, then there's nothing we can do. Dennis, do you want to compliment Yeah, very briefly. We don't have Article 23 legislation yet, but once we do, uh, uh, the theft, theft of state secrets could be a criminal uh, mm -hmm. conduct in Hong Kong, and thereby satisfying the double criminality requirement. I don't know whether that would be the case, but it could happen. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that we've reached uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, we've heard uh, from the speakers that uh, there is a lot of room for improvements in this um, project, uh, that both sides are agreeing to meet, uh, to uh, work on a, on a, on a better uh, option, and also uh, please extend our uh, invitation to uh, John Lee to uh, <laughs> come and uh, talk to us. And, uh, I have, a, I have a small present for our two uh, wonderful speakers today. It's a tie. Please wear it at uh, Lechco, Dennis Clark. And please wear it at Exco, uh, Mr. Tong. And thank you very much to all of you.